All righty. Hi, everyone. Oh, this happened before. Can everybody hear me? It's Diane. Yeah, loud and clear. Thank you. Ah, there it is. Try this again. Ah, oh, that's what it is. There is something wrong. There. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Committee of the Whole meeting to review and discuss the financial plan as discussed or as presented. Uh, I am John Jack. I am the director for Hoyat First Nations, and I'm also the chair of the regional district. So first off, we'll um, recognize that we're conducting our business today principally on the territories of the Herpetus and the Tshot First Nations. Um, our offices are located principally in the Alberni Valley area. And we're also coming to you from the traditional territories across New Tronoth and even perhaps Coast Salish territory as well, just because we're conducting a hybrid meeting today, which means that we do have individuals in the boardroom today. And I see Director Cal Roberts, as well as our CAO, Danielle Sayan, and uh, Wendy Thompson, our manager of administrative services there. Everyone else is coming in uh, through a Zoom meeting, which is broadcast live on YouTube um, through the ACRD channel, but also on our website embedded in the meeting page of the acrd.bc.ca website. The easiest way to do it, to get to it, is to go through the calendar function um, on the main page and just select today, select the meeting, and there you go. The materials are up there as well. And uh, yeah, so it appears as though we have only the one item, which is a presentation on the draft Alberta Clagget Regional District Financial Plan. I'm wondering if we could have someone move the agenda as proposed. Thank you, Director Shannon, seconded by Director McNabb. All in favor? All opposed? 
motion carried. Okay, so that brings us to item three, which is the presentation. Uh, and I'm wondering, Terry, if you wanted to take over. For sure, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, since this is the financial plan, Terry, please feel free to talk whenever you want and only be interrupted by myself and maybe Daniel. Um, but this really is uh, a showcase of, of all the work that you and your department have done and they're presenting it to the directors for the first time. So please okay. go ahead and thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. And I would just like to say that I, in presenter mode, I'm only going to see um, certain screens. So if someone sees a hand up, please um, make sure you speak up for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know if, if other folks just don't unmute and, and let you know as well. So I think we're okay. Okay. okay, thank you. So I'm pleased to be here today to present the 2022 to 2026 draft financial plan. Um, so the purpose of today is to kind of get the whole plan out there for us to begin our discussions that will take us over the next approximately five to six weeks. So I'm just having trouble getting it to go. Slideshow, there we go. Okay, so um, the financial plan, as we know, is a five-year plan. So it's current year plus four. We must have a plan for each service as a regional district, and our expenditures cannot exceed our revenues. We also must undertake a process of public consultation, and our plan has to be adopted by March 31st. Just a reminder of those finicky regional district financial rules, the areas are only charged for the services that they are provided and each service is independent. So I cannot transfer surplus from one service to a different service to support it. Um, and then this includes the allocation of staff and benefits. So to develop our financial plan, we took our existing operational costs. We looked at the 2021 to 2024 strategic plan that was adopted by the board last year. We also have completed all the asset management plans for our services now. So we definitely are using that as an integral part of our discussions. And then the goal is to adopt a plan that has the allocation of resources to achieve the desired outcomes of the board while remaining responsive to a changing social, environmental and financial context. I don't think this has been more important than it has in the last three years with COVID. So I'm just gonna pass it over to our CAO now and he's going to walk us through our strategic um, plan. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity in this budgeting process to highlight the areas of our strategic plan. Uh, I will flag that although I won't speak to every strategic priority, the strategic plan in its entirety um, remains a significant area of focus for all staff. And so I think it's important just to start the conversation with, with the plan. Uh, on this first slide here, social procurement uh, in 2022, we'll see the development of our first uh, social procurement policy. This is an important initiative that will help increase the value of our regional spending. Uh, appropriate staff are already going through the required training. And so we, uh, we're, we're definitely on pace uh, for the creation of that policy. We're also planning on bringing our existing purchasing policy back for some revision towards the end of the year. Now, we might see some changes on every objective that is slated for the end of the year, because with an election, uh, the board may opt to pause on some of these deliveries, but nonetheless, the plan identifies that arrival date, and so we're working towards the, these, uh, these objectives in 2022. Under community work funds, there's a significant amount of projects that fall under this initiative. Uh, they're still up for discussion, and so once approved, these community works projects will be an important part of staff work as we coordinate and implement the projects. We now have a new employee who's also focused on grants and asset management. And as a result, we will be developing more structure in this area and we'll be bringing back some prioritized options for future board consideration. Under enhanced agriculture, which is uh, uh, section 1.4, uh, this is a subject of a substantial grant funding that spans over three years. And uh, it's, it's focused on systems change in agriculture for the ACRD and is subject to significant dialogue and research for 2022. Uh, so there will be updates uh, later on in the year. Under parks and trail services, I want to flag this is an area uh, that also has a dedicated staff for the ACRD at this point. We have a mix of site-specific planning this year, as well as capital investment. 
and some uh, program development for 2022. Uh, if I could go to the next slide, please, Terry. So uh, the area of communications and engagement is an area of important change and growth for the ACRD in 2022. Uh, we've recently hired a dedicated employee for supporting the objectives of media engagement, public engagement, general communications, as well as the development of structure for optimizing our online platforms and communication. Uh, 2022 will see a significant effort placed in building these areas. And uh, I will flag or remind uh, the board that we are building many of these areas from scratch. So this is a, a new area for us. And um, we're hoping to see quite a bit of movement in 2022. Next slide. The implementation of asset management is something that all local governments are required to do and is an integral part of uh, good management practice. We have recently hired a new employee, as, as I flagged uh, a little bit earlier, uh, to help with the coordination of our organizational efforts. Uh, we do have ambitious targets for 2022 uh, under this area. So performing a condition assessment of critical assets starting the identification of key assets and implementing these in our GIS system, as well as developing both long-term financial plan and a capital reserve plan are, are big chunks of work. And so, um, you know, thumbs up to Amy and to Terry uh, for taking this on because it's been out by a lot of time and uh, resources in 2022. Also, an, another significant portion of our strategy is under the solid waste management. We're uh, planning a significant amount of work here. Um, and this includes the ongoing implementation of our regional organics diversion and the completion of a detailed design for enhanced leachate treatment on the West Coast. Uh, so uh, the um, solid waste is a regional effort. However, we, we have uh, broken it apart into various areas of the region as we implement the different strategies at a different pace. Slide four, please. Here, our region is exposed to a wide array of hazards and risks, and 2021 has seen significant activity above and beyond just what we saw in the pandemic. Um, I, I, I think I made light of it when I said in my first eight weeks working for the ACRD, we have activated more EOCs uh, than I saw in seven years with Falcon Beach. So it it's, uh, speaks to the level of activity of our emergency services. Uh, in 2022, we're planning on completing a hazard and risk and vulnerability analysis. And this is gonna help guide and update our emergency plans and training uh, moving forward. It's also gonna help link some of our, our discussions, activities and training uh, that we do in collaboration with uh, other members of our Federation. So there's a lot to do here and there's a lot to consider and it will actually um, uh, require quite a bit of, of uh, resources to, to complete in 2022 and will actually feed uh, a lot of the changes and updated plans moving forward into 2023 and beyond. Under slide five, we have engagement of community partners, um, which is an ongoing objective for 2022. And this is going to see us working with the identification of common objectives across the ACRD Federation members in order to create actionable tasks starting in 2023. So part of this is, is looking at what we've currently identified and what other members of our Federation have identified as priorities, but it's also looking forward to see uh, how it is that, that we're going to collaborate, work together uh, after the election that takes place in 2023. Um, we're also working on building uh, protocol agreements with regional First Nation communities. Um, and I, I, I did tweak something here and I'll flag that, that tweak with the, uh, with the board. Uh, our original focus was solely on the protocols, but since I've arrived, it's been made clear that there's a strong desire to be discussion, uh, hosting discussions around inclusive governance. And so I've added it to this section uh, because inclusive governance is, is an important portion and it, it uh, should walk step in step with protocol agreements. As we, uh, as we open up that, that discussion. So 5.2 has been amended. Um, and if the board has any issues with it, we should uh, bring that to a, a separate meeting for a formal amendment. Uh, under the strategic area of governance and service reviews, uh, the most significant objective remains the implementation of a, an engagement process for the Alberni Valley Aquatic Center. Uh, this is something that is um, 
uh, will likely span over more than one year of outreach and uh, needs to go hand in love with some of the activities that uh, Port Alberni is doing or commencing as part of their OCP overview as well. So um, the, uh, the other element here is, um, uh, sorry, I'm just finding my spot, oh, is transit. And uh, although transit has been delayed, uh, the implementation of transit, uh, particularly in the West, has been delayed uh, due to the pandemic. We are planning on seeing um, some commencement there in the fall of 2022. And of course, uh, we're hoping that the pandemic is something that is being phased out, which allows us to phase in regional transit. It's important for me to note that a significant amount of time and effort will go into the election that's scheduled for this fall. And we will be looking to coordinate our efforts around orientations, planning, training, um, immediately following that election. And, and so, so there'll be lots of moving parts, both before, during, and immediately after. If there's any questions around a strategic plan, I'm available to answer them. Thank you. Please go ahead, anyone. Okay, not seeing anything. It looks like we're, we're well aware of the strategic plan. Uh, please continue at your leisure. Thank you. Um, so just to outline how our process is going to go, last year we used what we called a parking lot format, but I think this year we're just going to take everything out to committee. So if there's a relevant committee, such as um, all the Alberni Valley stuff, we'll head to the Alberni Valley meeting that's held later this month. Um, the committee of the whole next week will include 911, general government and regional parks, just so we have another chance to really discuss them and make sure that there is no changes that you guys are wanting or further information. So I've just kind of outlined on these next couple slides how many more times we're going to discuss all this stuff. So we'll have a committee of the whole next week. And then um, at the board of directors next Wednesday, I will do what we call the official public consultation. So we'll do an abbreviated version of this presentation today at the beginning of the board meeting and um, the public has opportunity to speak at that. Um, and then we'll have the AVB and the electoral area admin, um, directors committee meeting on the 24th. So busy week next week, lots of budget talks. And then the following week, we'll have the West Coast committee and then um, continue on March 9th if we have further discussion all with the goal of adopting the hospital district on March 9th and the board of directors on March 23rd. So what we're looking for today is to really give you guys the highlights. We're gonna have department presentations from all the areas and we're looking to find out what areas you guys would like more information about. If you have a question we can answer immediately, we'll do that for sure. But if it's something you want us to dig in deeper or would like a more in-depth report on something, then we would love for you to flag that for us today so we can bring it forward to one of those meetings. Um, I touched on the public consultation, but it is a challenge during the pandemic um, to conduct public consultation as it's not in our traditional format. So we do have all of these opportunities. We um, are YouTubing all of our meetings. Um, questions and comments can be submitted to the budget at acrd.bc.ca email at any time. Uh, I am making a variety of public or community presentations to Banfield Community Affairs Society, Spirit Lake Community Association. If you have something in your area you'd like us to present to, please send me an email. We can arrange that. And then, as I mentioned, we'll do the official one that's advertised um, next Wednesday at 1.30. So just thought we'd talk a little bit about some of the grant funding that we've had before we dive into the services. So COVID restart funding, this actually was allocated to us um, some at the end of 2020. We had a little bit more come our way at the beginning of 2021. So we've spent a good portion of this at this point. Um, I've outlined what we spent it on in 2021. The things that are upcoming for this year is it will cover the portion of the protective services coordinator wages. Um, we still have virtual meeting costs as we're all still living that. We're gonna do some park enhancements, both community and regional parks. Uh, we need to support the community or the planning department. So in the fall, we approved uh, temporary um, resources to assist them with the increased development activity that we've had in the region. And then we're continuing to make IT improvements, both with how we communicate with the public, but also some of our internal processes and signing um, things. So we'll continue to use that funding um, until it's all spent. And I have to just make some reporting requirements on our financial statements. 
Other than that, we've had great success in grants. And now that we have a dedicated um, grant coordinator, we're hoping we can increase this even more. But we completed numerous grants in 2021, including a whole bunch of in the ag initiative area, um, some with the airports, the fire departments, we were very successful. So um, this has the completed grants, but I've also indicated which ones are ongoing. So a lot of these started, some of them even in 2020, and they're going to be continuing in 2022. Um, and finally, I've made a list of kind of the ones we know to date that we are going to be applying for and are hopeful like these programs have been announced and um, but the and the applications have gone in, but we don't know if they've been awarded or not. So these are kind of our upcoming for 2022. So I, um, a very successful area. Of course, these grants don't cover staff time to administer the grants and that has become an increasing um, bulk of work, which is why we have the grant coordinator to support it. In 2021, we had 41 active grants running through, which is fantastic. The other item that we wanted to talk about as a financial plan of the whole is the resources. So last year, there were sig significant resources um, added to implement the strategic plan. And so I just wanted to go through and remind everyone of these resources. And some of these resources are really just getting going now based on hiring dates. And so the financial impact of these can be seen and makes up a good portion of that impact in 2022. Because for example, the purchasing coordinator didn't come on until the fall of 2022. So we only had a quarter of their wages last year, but now we're gonna have a full year. So um, just thought we'd run through those as well. And the last component that was established last year that was new was we created some rate stabilization reserves because we had some unusual surpluses in a few services. So this year for the electoral area administration service, we're actually going to use the 45,000 that we put into the reserve last year to offset some of the election costs. The custom transit, the Alberni Valley custom transit reserve about 74,000, we're gonna hold on to that for one more year um, to offset next year's increase. And in West Coast Transit, we put about $84,000 into reserve and we're gonna use that this year to start the construction of the bus stops and shelters, even though the service um, is not anticipated to start until early next year. So now, unless there's some questions on that, we can hand, we'll hand it over to Mike and we can start talking about the departmental presentations. Thank you. Are there any questions about the overview or shall we get right into the department presentations? Okay. Okay, please take it away, Mike, and thank you. Okay, um, so uh, hi everybody. Uh, for the first slide, um, the, the population census data, um, was released on February 9th, and we thought it would be a good a good place to start. So I do want to note that the census data is <clears throat> reflects populations up to May 2021. So most of 2021, um, any growth, um, which I would estimate there's a substantial amount um, in our area, isn't captured in here. But um, overall, the ACRD um, grew just over 8%. Um, and, and again, like I said, we are observing... Um, what we, we certainly appears and we see as continuing growth. Um, I would note the electoral areas have seen substantial growth as well. And certainly this is reflected in um, the significant increase in development applications that, that we're having. And, and um, you know, there's a summary of all of the areas in there and, and certainly the growth um, varies. Um, some of the populations are smaller, but um, before we go to the next slide, was there any questions anybody had about this one? Okay, if there's any questions, I'll go to the next slide on regional planning. Um, so just, just a quick overview of, of regional planning provides um, recommendations in response to referral applications. And, and this area covers uh, day-to-day -day referrals from things like crown leases, agricultural land reserves, covers off all of the work uh, we're doing in the agricultural, um, on the ag plan and the systems change um, grant funding that we have. And I'll talk in more de detail in a second about that. Um, uh, 
work on dispersed camping is is uh, and the studies that that we're looking at doing this year are going to flow through here and, and those are the main topics of um, projects um, is the ag plan and dispersed camping for this year um, uh, subdivision referrals come through this um, portion of planning and, and i certainly would know that there's been a significant increase um, for 2021 compared to 2019, we've seen a 214% increase in subdivision applications. So that's um, you know, certainly part of the growth and development that we're seeing. Um, and I'll go to the next slide, please. And I again talked about uh, applications. Uh, cannabis retail falls under this, um, this service. And, um, and ALR applications I already mentioned. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this talks about the um, the agri agriculture initiatives we're doing, and so um, you know through the ag support contract um, through Eden Tree Farms, which is Heather Chauvin and Anna Lewis, um, continuing to to support um, agriculture planning in the region as a as a whole with uh, support and guidance from the Agriculture Development Committee. Um, we are going to be entering year two of the expanding uh, the influence of regional agriculture support. Uh, this is the Systems Change Program, uh, which is a $300,000 grant funded by the Vancouver Foundation. Um, also, continuing on with uh, um, the Council for Water, uh, for Agriculture Water Supply, and it's a producer-led um, monitoring framework, again, supported by funding. And I wanted to, uh, we're, we're working on another um, training program um, that North Island College will be delivering as well. So that's sort of the summary there of the agriculture uh, projects we've got. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. The next thing I'm gonna talk about uh, management of development. So this is the rural planning. So uh, regional planning is, is the planning that is not, uh, covered by the entire regional district participates in rural planning, which is uh, it's part 14 of the act, but it is our community plan zoning, um, you know, development variances, um, some of the major pro um, project work we're doing, housing needs reports for the rural areas um, falls under this service. And um, so that is electoral area directors and Tofino participates for any any uh, applications or projects that fall within Clayquot Sound. So, so there is a, a longstanding agreement uh, Tofino has with the ACRD to participate in a portion of this service. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. So just, you know, again, summarizing, the slide summarizes the types of applications. Um, again, just wanna highlight the increase in um, rezoning applications. So in 2021, compared to 2020, uh, there was a 50% increase in applications. And if we compared the number of, so this is rezoning applications specifically. Uh, and if we compared um, 2019 rezoning applications to 2021, that's 110 percent increase. So I, I know we've, I've talked, um, you know, periodically with the board over the last year and a half about the increased development activity in, in our area. And I think it's important to highlight that. Um, so the majority of the work in this area is responding to public inquiries and, and um, public or owner initiated applications. Um, you know, rezonings are up significantly in the last two years. Um, I did just want to talk a little bit about meetings we hold. So this we we hold for this service. So that is um, advisory planning commissions, public hearings. So in 2021, we did do 19 advisory planning commission meetings, 11 public hearings, and uh, seven meetings um, related to zoning and housing needs reports um, were also held in there. And I just also uh, would like to note that. Um, Based on the current applications that are in in the works, um, there are about 158 um, lots um, proposed uh, for development within the regional district. So that's that's a significant amount. Um, and I think we can go to the next slide. So then, just for policy uh, for projects for this um, for this year, certainly looking at completing the zoning bylaw update. Um, implementing and, and issuing where appropriate uh, tickets under the bylaw notice enforcement. And uh, we're also required to cancel land use contracts um, by 2024. And that's part of the zoning bylaw review. And then again, as I mentioned, just reviewing and processing development applications. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, was Before I continue into bylaw enforcement, was there any questions about the rural planning or regional planning? 
I have Director Cote. Thank you. Uh, so uh, with the, sorry, sorry about that. I'll just mute for a moment till it stops. Oh, you're still muted, Director Cote. Sorry, uh, the Good. significant amount of um, building applications. Is there any um, multifamily developments um, that would actually offer low cost housing in that? Um, no, no, not certainly nothing I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, we are we are seeing um, you know eight accessory dwelling unit applications ADUs, so that that is certainly a component, and I think that's a, a significant uh, could be a, a significant contribution, especially in rural areas around um, uh, meeting some housing needs. Right, I'm quite concerned about uh, the lack of affordable housing that's um, popping up uh, around. And I had another question about the. Uh, uh, right before the population page, there's a converted values for the hospital uh, uh, assessed values. And I'm wondering if that's with the new assessments or not. And I, I guess that's a separate question that probably should go to Terry. That would be Thanks. a Terry question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's okay. No. Sure. Um, so you're talking about in the financial plan package itself? And the, so the hospital, what they call the hospital district values are what regional districts tax off of. They're very similar to the regular general municipal, but that is our assessed values for 2022 compared to 2021. Right, I just wondered if that was capturing the new assessments or if they were for next year. No, it's capturing the new ones though. So we get what we call, they call a completed role as January 1st of 2022. There will be a revised role released by them um, based on everyone who's done appeals. Um, so the revised role comes out at the end of March, but it's based on the 2022 role at this time. Thank you. Okay, um, there's no other questions. I'll carry on with, um, Bylaw enforcement. Um, so we, we have a bylaw enforcement uh, service. I, I would note that complaints were up in 2021 to 38 uh, from 26 the previous year. Um, projects include um, you know, implementing the ticketing, as I've already mentioned, and, and implementing the uh, the burning bylaw uh, as far as education and and letting people um, you know enforcing that that bylaw as well. I would note that the, the new bylaw enforcement policy that was recently adopted by the board has been very helpful, um, certainly for staff, um, I think the public and directors in, in just providing clear direction and, and, and clear prioritization for which bylaw enforcement complaints we proceed with. Um, and uh, is there any questions about bylaw enforcement? Okay, I'll go to the next slide, please. We're all, I'm almost done with uh, with our services here. So the last the last one I wanted to talk about was building um, inspection, and and so uh, this is a, an electoral area service, um, you know, and it is it's very much a, a service driven um, um, service. We uh, we you know it's based on the number of applications. Certainly, building activity um, is up. I think we issued 109 applications um, in 2021. Um, the data that we had put together, we had received um, about 144 applications in total. Now, all of those haven't been processed, and we do periodically have applications that that don't get issued or never get finalized. Um, and I would just note that you know that I had mentioned the the new development application specifically around rezoning and and um, subdivision applications. You know, generally result in construction, and and often we see this happen within one to two years um, of of those things of those uh, subdivision applications being completed. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has about building inspection. Don't see any questions about building inspection. Okay, then it's uh, over to Wendy. All right, great. Great, thank you. 
Please go ahead. Thanks. So I'm pleased to present the uh, general government services highlights for 2021, 2022. In 2021, the regional district board of directors adopted their very first strategic plan. The plan unites the board of directors under a common vision for the region and provides clear priorities and focus for staff. The ACRD procedures bylaw was amended um, in 2021 to permanently authorize um, ACRD board and committee meetings to be held in person electronically or as a hybrid meeting, which is basically a combination of um, in-person and electronics, similar to what we're doing today. Uh, the ACRD continues to manage impacts to operations from the COVID-19 pandemic. Regional district staff um, closely monitor provincial health orders, work safe BC and other authorities to ensure the health, safety and well-being of our employees, elected officials and the public are being met. Um, the regional district COVID safety plan is updated as needed and reflects the most current medical and safety information available. Um, we have the plan available on our website as well as at all our work locations. Um, also in 21, 2021, the Wood Stove Exchange Program saw an uptake with 18 exchanges compared to seven the previous year. The regional district was successful in receiving continued funding through the BC Lung Association for 2022 to provide homeowners financial assistance in replacing old wood stoves with an efficient low emission models or alternative uh, fuel sources. The health network continues to work to address the determinants of health um, and support healthy communities in the region. The ACRD was successful in receiving funding from Island Health for another three year term and this funding is to secure a net, uh, coordinator to support the network. Now for 2022, a few highlights. Um, in January 2022, the regional district retained a communications coordinator. The main focus for this position in 2022 will be developing um, a communications and engagement program for the regional district, as well as revamping the regional district's website and expanding the use of social media platforms for public communications, including the development of a Facebook page. Um, in March of this year, um, we will undertake a board uh, renumeration review. This is done every four years as per um, policy, which guides the process. And we appoint three independent and independent individual, individuals to sit on this committee to conduct that review. Um, IT has been very busy. Um, there's increases in this budget to reflect additional workstations for our new staff. Um, this year, we'll need to purchase, um, potentially purchase new iPads or laptops um, for any new uh, board members we may have after the election. Um, one other um, area that we really have to do some work on this year, developing processes, is around security. Um, we need to develop process to ma maintain an adequate level of cybersecurity. This is in part due to the increased demands from our insurance companies, and there have been increases in numbers of cyber attacks. The manager of IT plans to complete the migration of all users to Microsoft Office 365 in 2022. As well, regional district staff will continue to review and update current policies and bylaws. In 2022, um, several policies have been identified and will be drafted for consideration of the board. That includes a surveillance policy, electronic signatures, and a policy for our special events grant. Funds have been included in the draft financial plan for the regional district to expand offices to the downstairs portion of the administration building, which is currently leased to Coastal Community Credit Union. The credit union has given notice that it will be moving out of this space this summer. The regional district proposes to take over the portion of the building for much needed office and meeting space. With addi additional resources retained, the regional district has run out of workstations and meeting space. Some renovations will be required prior to the regional district moving into the space. And that's uh, all for general government. If there's any questions. Any questions? Okay, not seeing any, please move on. Great, I will start with electoral administration budget. So included in this budget, um, once again, as we do every year, is the ability for electoral area directors to continue to do mail outs um, of newsletters um, to their constituents. Also included in this budget is registration expenses for electoral area directors to, to attend UBCM, AVICC conventions, and as well the electoral area directors forum. Also in the budget this year will be the condu conducting the 22 election in the six electoral areas of the region. 
This year, the election budget has been increased to reflect increased protocols due to the COVID-19 pandemic and increased resources will be required to manage mail ballot voting. Um, legislation has changed now allowing any eligible voter to vote by mail ballot. So there is a bit more um, staff time required to manage that. And that is all I had. I'm gonna turn it over to Tara to talk about community works funds. Great, thank you very much. Um, so this is the Community Works Fund Plan. We have come to the Electoral Area Directors Committee a couple times now as we're trying to devise a more broad five-year plan. Um, the UBCM and the federal government would like the majority of our existing Community Works Funds to be spent by March 2024. And so we've really had to put our mind to a more comprehensive five-year plan. So this is the draft that we've come up with. I think there are still more discussions to be had over the rest of this budget. Um, but this allocates the majority of our community works funds. So as you'll see, there's a focus on drinking water, um, some active transportation and park stuff. Um, but also we have the expanded category now of fire halls, which we've never had the opportunity to invest in using these funding. So we have um, upgrades to all three of our volunteer fire departments to occur over the next four years. Um, so I think that covers, this also resides in that electoral area administration service that Wendy started. So if there's any questions about either of that, um, be happy to take those now. Thank you. Uh, Director Shannon, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, when I was looking at this and looking at the financial plan, I believe these are on page 82, um, I'm just, I didn't see the Beaver Creek Community Hall's $50,000 that we had talked about and just wondering if that's reflected somewhere else that I missed. Sure. Yeah, so um, it's actually on this slide. It is this one. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, can you? But it's there about halfway down. Um, it does show up a little bit different in the community plan in the um, the financial plan because it's a grant to an outside organization. So it doesn't come out of our reserve fund. It's actually out of the operating um, budget in the electoral area admin. There'll be, there's actually three grants running through there that have been summarized, but I'll make sure I actually split those out when we bring that back to the EA committee so that the two organizations being the Beaver Creek Community Club and the Spurt Lake Community Association can see that their funding is sitting there. So can do that. Thanks, Terry. That I that, that's awesome, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I see Director McNabb, please go ahead. Uh, Director McNabb, you are muted though. Yeah, I know, I'm trying to, trying to get there. Uh, so the discussion with regards to the Cherry Creek uh, Fire Hall uh, funding from this account, uh, when are we going to have that? Um, we can bring that back to the Electoral Area Directors Committee meeting, if you like, next week. Um, we currently have $600,000 that we left unallocated at this time. Um, so I don't think staff necessarily have anything paperwork wise to bring back at this time, but we can bring back that discussion to be had next week if you like. Sure, that'd be good. Okay. Any further comments? Okay, seeing none, please go ahead, Terry. Just wanted to touch on the finance department as a whole. So in 2021, um, we managed to complete all of our um, version one of our asset management plan. So there's 13 asset management plans in total. Staff have recently received a facility condition assessment report for all of our buildings in the region. So that gives us a way more detailed look at um, the ages of the different components of our building. And we will be bringing that to the board later this spring. We just got to wrap our heads around it and need to compare it to the numbers that we had originally estimated in our asset management plans. So that's gonna be very important, not only for this, but also for as we get into that asset retirement obligation discussion. Um, which is a public sector accounting board standard that is upcoming faster than I would like and needs some significant staff time this year. Um, we've managed to put it off due to COVID. They've delayed it slightly, but it is now um, here and needs to be done. 
Um, the other part is uh, my department has expanded this year as we have centralized both grant administration and procurement. So prior to, um, I'd say the fall of 2021, this has all been done decentralized. Every um, department had multiple people doing grant administration and their purchasing. So now we have a pr um, procurement coordinator and we have a grant coordinator that is combined with asset management. So really just working on setting up some procedures to make it very clear to all the departments and even the outside organizations that we work with on um, these aspects. And finally, we still have, we have budgeting software, we're getting the hang of it now and really just wanting to work on the reporting aspect of that in 2022. And then we also met last week, everything's a blur, but I believe it was last week um, regarding the grant needs. And so those have been included in the financial plan, except for these four that have been deferred um, and will be brought forward to the committee of the whole meeting on February 23rd. And then the other one that I didn't mention here, but is um, Pat Deacon, the economic development grant to the city of Port Alberni. He is going to come um, in the, to the board meeting next week on February 23rd. Yeah, February 23rd, because he's not available. So he'd be a fifth grant need that we have yet to um, make a decision on. And I think that is it for now for me. And I'd like to pass it over to Heather unless there are any more questions. Doesn't look like we have any questions. So thank you, Terry, and welcome, Heather. Thank you. Uh, so just give a bit of an update on the Alberni Valley Emergency Program from uh, last year. So in April, we hired the Protective Services Coordinator. Uh, coordinator. Uh, we implemented the ESS program, which is the Emergency Support Services Program, um, and ended our contract with Red Cross. We had eight calls in 2021, um, 270 volunteer and staff hours were spent, and we supported 46 evacuees. So it was a very busy first year for that program. Uh, we did a lot of EOC training. Um, in June, we had um, EOC training and tabletop exercise. In September, we had a wildfire exercise. And then in November, we had the elected officials training. Uh, the emergency program supported several emergencies um, in the Valley, including COVID, heat, uh, wildfire, flooding, the Zim King Kingston ship, and a tsunami uh, concern in July. Uh, we implemented the Fire Smart program, which was funded by the province. Uh, we entered into two MOUs, one with the Salvation for Emergency Support Services, and we entered into one with the Fall Fair for um, an evacuation location for hobby farm animals. We worked with uh, Dr. Ryan Reynolds from UBC on the Canadian Hazards Emergency Response Preparedness app, which is um, an app to encourage uh, local residents to create an emergency plan for themselves and to become better uh, prepared. Um, we were successful in receiving a ESS and EOC grant from the province, um, which supported a lot of the training we did and a lot of the supplies that we purchased last year. Um, and then the Alberni Valley Evacuation Group Plan, which is still ongoing, but most of the work occurred in 2021. Um, the board will be presented this plan on March 9th at the board meeting. Uh, next slide, please. And then the 2020, sorry, 2022 priorities for the program are to conduct a hazard and risk vulnerability assessment, uh, which Daniel alluded to earlier. Uh, this aligns with the board's strategic plan objective to undertake a climate change risk assessment. Uh, so the HRVA will be done for all areas of the regional district, including Banfield and Long Beach. Um, the hazards identified uh, will form the basis of the updates to the Alberni Valley Emergency uh, Plan, which is also scheduled for this, this year. There'll be a continued focus on training uh, EOC staff to build skills and confidence uh, with ACRD and city staff and to build relationships with First Nations and emergency agencies in the community. We'll be uh, continuing to implement the ESS program. Uh, we'll be redeveloping a personal preparedness program. Uh, the CHIRP app rollout that I mentioned earlier will be part of this, as will be the development of an evacuation uh, for focus brochure for the Alberni Valley. Um, and then the last one is the FireSmart program, which is grant dependent, and we anticipate uh, receiving that um, notification in March. Next slide, please. 
And then the Banfield Emergency Program. So there was little activity in the program in 2021. Um, our volunteer emergency program coordinator stepped down. So I'm currently uh, recruiting for that position. Um, there are several volunteers in Banfield, um, existing and new volunteers, but none of them are ready to step up into the coordinator role. So until that role is filled, I will support the, the group there. Uh, we have a training um, scheduled for uh, the volunteers in April in person. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the HRVA will be done for Banfield as well. Uh, we are we have applied for the ESS grant and we will be applying for the EOC grant, uh, which will include some supplies and training for Banfield. Uh, we've also partnered with uh, the Huwait First Nations, Uchukwesit and Toquat on a grant application to develop a West Coast evacuation route plan. Uh, and we hope to hear the results of this grant application in March. And that also includes the Long Beach electoral area. Next slide, please. And then the Long Beach emergency program. Uh, so most of the work in 2021 was centered around determining the emer emergency program model for the electoral area. So we have a long standing agreement with the district of Euculet for them to provide certain emergency services for the residents of Long Beach, but not all services. Um, the, out, the agreement is outdated and it's vague. So um, I'm interested in um, negotiating a new agreement with the district of Euculet if they're willing uh, to collaborate on um, providing emergency services for those residents out there. Um, HRVA I talked about already. Um, and we have also, we're also partnering with the District of Euculet and Tofino on a grant application. Um, if successful, we'll be doing a regional exercise on the West Coast and it will involve um, all First Nations on the coast, Parks Canada and emergency agencies. Be a great opportunity to um, do some emergency planning on the West Coast. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, we've partnered on the uh, West Coast evacuation route plan, and we will find out the results of that in March. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then this final uh, slide is regarding the West Coast Emergency Coordination Service, and this is a proposed service. Uh, it's been discussed by the board since 2016. Um, so each under provincial legislation, each local government First Nation is responsible for their own emergency program. Um, and on the West Coast, it creates a very fragmented um, emergency response as each local government, each First Nation is focused on their own jurisdiction and there isn't a lot of coordination across um, emergency programs. So the idea for this proposed service was to determine if there are ways that the local governments and First Nations could partner on a service to provide more coordinated emergency response, but it's not to replace any of the existing programs because they are uh, legally required. Uh, the proposed service recognizes the close proximity of the communities to each other and the length of distance for outside assistance. Um, so the board did allocate some COVID restart funds toward this service, but at this time, um, uh, the service been, has really been limited to initial staff discussions. And next slide, please. And that's it for me. I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie, unless there's any questions for me. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions on the previous slides? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Heather, and welcome, Charlie. And please go Good ahead. Afternoon. Just a few highlights for the volunteer fire departments. In the past year, we um, hired Dave Mitchell Associates to do a fire service review. The last one was done in 2010. We expect to have the finalized version of that within the next few weeks. And we'll be looking in the new year of implementing the history of fire service with recommendations to ensure that each department is meeting its fundamental statutory requirements for category requirements is capable of meeting its fundamental services and all that that contains. Um, and this year, uh, Banfield has ordered up a new mini pumper, which we expect to see um, late fall. They did a lot of work on that and they're really happy that's for the west side. Uh, Sprout Lake has a new water tender truck ordered uh, and an upgrade to number three fire hall plan on the water tender. Well, it was ordered this year with the uh, delay in chassis. We're not expecting to see it before 2023. Uh, Beaver Creek is doing an upgrade of their SCBA. After 30 years, they've dragged this out as long as they possibly could before replacing this equipment, and that's going to happen. Um, 
Sprout Lake also did a review this past year of their way they handled their halls, the three halls. And uh, we de de ended up decommissioning or partially decommissioning number two hall as a response for fire responses. And with that, we've been able to rearrange the apparatus and cut back and save services and rearrange some people. And now we're gonna do an upgrade to number three hall to uh, an additional truck bay generator and accessibility improvements. So there's lots going on. Um, Banfield also has a look at doing an upgrade to their fireboat in the coming year to better meet the uh, bus requirements and the fire underwriters service requirements. And that's about it. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Director Bodner, please go ahead. And then Director McNabb. Thank you. Um, just a few questions here. Uh, you were saying that um, um, you, you, the fire services review was done in 2010. How often are they usually done? It's at the uh, whim of the board or staff, I would guess. Uh, we thought after 10 years, there was quite a few deficiencies that had been dealt with, but it was long past needing to be redone again to have a look at how the fire services evolved in, within the region. So, uh, and you don't have anything to do with the Cherry Creek Fire Department then? No, this, the review in 2010 included all the area fire departments, including Port Alberni City and Cherry Creek. This okay. review we, we kept with to just the ACRD controlled fire departments, Banfield, Sprout Lake and Beaver Creek. Okay, thank you for that. Welcome. Director McNabb, please go ahead. And then Director Roberts. So I, I wonder, Charlie, if you could explain the uh, $50,000 addition to uh, our three fire departments, uh, uh, kind of on the bottom corner, I'm not really quite sure what it's about. Uh, I think Terry popped up there too, but I'll do my best. Uh, I think with uh, the recommendations that will come out of the fire service review, we felt there might be some costs involved there. So we wanted to make sure there was something set aside to cover that. Terry, you any further to add? Yeah, I would just like to add, it's a challenging time for us to be getting this review. There is, um, it's like a 220 page document that identifies um, a whole number of items that they think that we should be addressing. And there are multiple ways for us to address them. So I think it's going to result in um, some more resources. We don't know what that looks like at this time. Um, options are moving um, like the fire chiefs to be having more of a role and more of compensation because of that role? Is it going to have an impact on the regional um, fire services coordinator role? Um, there's a bunch of admin level support that or documentation that the report is saying that we need. So at this time, staff aren't comfortable making a very clear recommendation of what that resource looks like, but we also don't want to add or leave out um, funding in this financial plan to address it because we wanna be able to action these items um, once we decide what it looks like. So at this point, we've put $50,000 into each of the three departments so that we can work with the directors, the fire chief and staff to kind of digest this information and, um, and come up with a plan uh, that would um, convert that 50,000 into action. Um, yeah, I think that would be all I would like to add at this time. Okay. I think that brings us to Director Roberts and then Director Bodner. To the chair, uh, to Charlie, uh, what's the uh, approximated cost for the Dave Mitchell and Associates uh, survey? Thank you. 20,000, I think was the figure. It's been quite a while since I looked at that cost, but I believe it was 20,000 that was set aside to cover that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bodner. And did I miss anyone? No? Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Bodner. 
Thank you. Uh, to the chair, to Terry, um, the $50,000, does that include Cherry Creek? No, it's 50,000 for the Sprout Lake Department, 50,000 for Bamfield, and 50,000 for Beaver Creek. So each of those services, we've budgeted an additional 50 grand to address the deficiencies identified in the report. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any further comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, Charlie, I th is that it for you or is there more? That, that is it for me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Next up is oh, Regional Parks. Michael, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. <clears throat> uh, and it's my pleasure to go over our park services with you. Um, so for 2021, uh, I viewed it as a bit of a foundational work year. Uh, <clears throat> we were able to finish the level of service review as identified in the street plan, uh, our asset management plan. We adopted a park inspection and maintenance policy uh, <clears throat> and using those foundations that we did last year, I think that in 2022, we're gonna be able to see a lot more on the ground, um, <clears throat> tangible projects uh, going forward and, uh, and all built off of those three foundational pieces. So uh, I wanna bring your attention to uh, our signage design guideline project uh, that we've been developing. It should be complete this spring. <clears throat> and I think it's gonna have a huge impact on you know, the look and feel and the user friendliness of our park services. Uh, <clears throat> so when people are utilizing parks, uh, the park user will you know, have ACRD branded signage uh, that's you know, comprehensive, uh, simple and easy to read, whether it's uh, identification signage or um, <clears throat> regulatory signage. Um, and not only are we going to do the guideline, but we'll outroll uh, a number of um, physical signage earlier this year or later later in the summer. Uh, and that'll be both for regional parks and within the community services. Uh, <clears throat> the next one I wanted to bring attention to was uh, where we've begun our first of a number of management plans uh, that we're going to be pursuing over the next couple of years. The goal is to do two management plans a year. And for uh, uh, regional parks later in this year, we'll be beginning uh, the log train trail management plan. Uh, now log train trail is a huge asset for all of the Alberni Valley. Uh, and it's gonna be an interesting conversation with the community uh, just because there's various different stakeholders and uh, <clears throat> different points of view for you know, setting those long-term and medium-term goals for the vision of the park. And, uh, how people utilize that trail and how we can best manage it. So, you know, I encourage all the directors to, uh, you know, uh, contribute to, you know, setting that direction uh, as we manage that uh, asset going forward. Um, <clears throat> for our regional park uh, MUP update, uh, I think most of you are familiar with the West Coast Northeast Path, uh, the scope of the project. In 2021, we were able to secure the tenure from the province uh, we also moved our design up to uh, mostly complete um, our detailed design. Uh, we also allocated 550,000 from community works funding that bridged uh, a gap for the funding. So we currently have two identified grants and you know, if we're successful for both of those grants to uh, the level that we anticipate, you know, I think it's a real possibility that we'd be able to begin the construction phase uh, in this year. So <clears throat> that's exciting for that project who's been on the books for quite a while. Uh, also, last year we brought some community correspondence from Franklin Bridge to the board. Uh, we have recently begun some project scoping uh, for that project. Uh, once that scoping is complete, I'll bring a, a report to the board and we'll uh, set some future direction for whether we want to pursue the construction of a bridge on Franklin, uh, that's the Alberni on that trail. <clears throat> I've also been uh, a participant in Mosaic and um, the province's uh, working group to better establish public access for backcountry um, recreational access on private forestry land. Uh, their main pilot project right now is the Ash Main. Uh, ACRD Parks doesn't have any infrastructure in the Ash Main, but um, <clears throat> you know, we're there participating and helping uh, drive the direction there because once the Ash Main has been um, complete and everybody's satisfied with 
how the pilot project went. <clears throat> the goal is to turn our sights to uh, Mount Aerosmith in that area. So uh, hopefully we're able to start making that shift this year and uh, we'll gain some traction for, for that project. Uh, are there any questions for regional parks now? I have directors Corbeil and then Bodner. Thanks, Chair Jack. Um, Michael, I think you answered it, especially in regards to the log train trail. Um, I assume you're going to coordinate with the city in that regard. <clears throat> uh, through the chair. Yeah, our park management plan and all these plans are <clears throat> directly related to our park assets that we currently manage. I know the log train trail kind of goes through uh, the city as well and has some private trails through uh, Mosaic. <clears throat> and we'd coordinate through all the stakeholders, uh, but specifically the plan would address uh, our tendered um, or our license area for the park. So it wouldn't be a joint plan, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, and the second comment I would have and it sounds like uh, maybe you're making some inroads with Mosaic. I mean, they've been talking about the Ash River for or the Ash Valley for some time now. And I, for one, am getting extremely frustrated at the lack of progress on opening up our, our back country. So maybe you have a better feel for it. But from what I see from my end of it, it's uh, awful slow in the, uh, in the uptake. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just provide comment that, you know, I think the uh, Ash Main uh, pilot project has gone well, as in there's been no negative impacts that's been noted in the project. And, uh, you know, I think the province and um, Mosaic are working together for an MOU regarding liabilities for road use and whatnot. And that's kind of been the sticking point that's been drawn out. Uh, so hopefully... You know, I'm optimistic that that'll get resolved. <clears throat> and once that's resolved, um, we're able to get a little bit more movement on it. Okay. And uh, I think next up we have Dr. Bodner. Thank and then you. Director McNabb. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the chair, to uh, Mike. Um, I know this isn't a regional park, but it is certainly a safety issue is regarding the hole in the wall. And it, it's a complicated operation, I understand, but I'm just wondering if, uh, if it is our responsibility in any way to be able to have to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you for the question uh, through the chair. Uh, <clears throat> so the province has reached out to the ACRD to begin a working group um, to discuss, uh, you know, the future of the hole in the wall. Uh, it got pushed back a couple of times due to flooding and whatnot, <clears throat> and it hasn't happened quite yet. But, you know, I think that being on the work plan is, um, you know, it's optimistic that we'll find some good traction there uh, once we have those meetings. But at the moment, uh, we don't have any tenure for the hole in the wall area or the associated trails. Uh, you know, the impacted stakeholders are the Mishir transportation where most of the parking occurs and then Mosaic, uh, that's private land where the trails are. So <clears throat> I think working with them to find some solutions is uh, the way we need to go. Thank you, good luck. <laughs> Dr. McNabb, please go ahead. So, uh, Michael, I'm just kind of wondering when the bridge over the river Plestead is going to happen. The uh, you mean Ever Evergreen Park? Oh, the Evergreen Park. So <clears throat> uh, that'll be kind of addressed in the next slide, but essentially yeah, community parks. So um, we were successful in some grant funding uh, the last year. Uh, and then <clears throat> due to uh, an aluminum shortage, uh, we just weren't able to put the bridge together in time for the fisheries window to get it done last year. But uh, so this year uh, we're on top of it, we're going to order uh, the bridge construction uh, relatively soon, but it does need to occur during our fisheries window since we're working near the creek. So it will be installed this summer. So 
by the end of the summer in the middle of the uh, summer yeah we'll, we'll try to get the <laughs> as early in the fisheries window as we can um but generally the, the windows you know july 15th to september 15th so hopefully july okay appreciate it thanks <clears throat> uh, if there's no more questions on the regional parks, I can touch base on the community parks now. Uh, Michael, I have Dr. Cote. She just put her hand up. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you. My question was on, on community parks and uh, planning on that. So I'll wait. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, I'll go over the community park services uh, briefly here now too. So a lot of the uh, funding for some of that foundational work <clears throat> flows through regional parks, uh, like the signage program and whatnot, because the grant funding that we get that we'll be using for all of the park services, um, <clears throat> it's just cleaner than separating it into each community park budget. So that's why you see a large funding amount in the, uh, the regional park services. Um, but <clears throat> I think it's important to note that uh, a lot of that foundational work for regional parks, you know, is also being utilized within the community parks. So <clears throat> we're devoting more resources uh, to these services. Uh, we're gonna be seeing a large influx of new signage in these parks this summer. Uh, we're utilizing the asset management plan uh, and these services that have a large number of assets, you know, we're beginning to <clears throat> have long-term plans for the replacement of those assets. So we're funding uh, the parks appropriately to be in a good spot when those, those assets reach their end of life. Um, <clears throat> and through the level of service um, review that we did last year, you know, one of the main uh, talking points that was brought up when engaging with our parks commissions and our trail volunteers was just how, uh, how many, a few volunteers there are compared to how many there used to be and also that a number of volunteers are aging out of the program so uh, one of our goals is to set up a volunteer program a formalized uh, <clears throat> program that not only supports our current volunteers but helps them recruit new ones to to help with the, uh, our park services <clears throat> uh, we're also utilizing the adopted inspection and maintenance policies throughout here to identify uh, you know areas of, um, of need. So uh, I'll just go over a quick highlights for each service. Banfield, <clears throat> uh, the community has uh, initiated development of West Park as uh, their priority this year. Uh, they've been really creative with their design and their funding strategy. So uh, we're supporting them and interested in to see how that goes. I think they're very close to having it fully funded and uh, hopefully they're able to do some construction this year. <clears throat> in Sprout Lake, the big project there is uh, the Lakeshore Road trail construction. Uh, we were successful in getting a grant last year. Uh, we were able to complete the design and we were able to secure tenure for the trail corridor from the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, we'll be <clears throat> submitting a tender uh, within the next month or two, and then uh, construction will begin this summer. And uh, we need to do a number of those works within the Fisheries window as well. So. Hopefully we're able to complete that uh, extension this fall. Uh, on Beaver Creek, <clears throat> like I said earlier, Evergreen Park uh, bridge replacement uh, will be occurring this year. Uh, we've also identified some flooding and uh, footing issues within the riding ring, which uh, requires some attention. So <clears throat> we've uh, budgeted for those uh, initiatives. And then Cherry Creek, I mentioned the park management plans earlier. Uh, our first one is the Maplehurst Park Plan, and we picked this one because there were uh, important needs uh, that would need to be addressed sooner uh, rather than later. So <clears throat> I, I sent an email to the directors, uh, I believe it was last week, and you know, I encourage everybody to you know, provide their input and uh, help us you know, guide this develop or park management process um, because I think it's, uh, it's an important piece of the park services. And we're having good conversations with the public here. So, thanks. Uh, are there any questions for the community park services? I don't see any further comments. Or, oh, Director McNabb, yeah, sorry about that. Please go ahead. So, this is kind of the very first thing I've heard about this riding ring uh, piece. Um, I, I, I mean, I think 
the directors of the area should be part of the conversation of where we're going to head with funding. Uh, the riding ring was actually developed by uh, the um, equestrian group uh, previously, and I don't know how much input they've had into that. It was is there is is technically their ring and their operation, but. So I, I, I just kind of think um, uh, with, I'm, the director needs to be kind of ahead of these things versus the receiving end of it. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> and yeah, thanks through <clears throat> the chair. Uh, I think it was with consultation with the, uh, the horse group there, the Backcountry Horse Society. Uh, <clears throat> I kind of identifying, you know, issues with, um, overland flooding and, and drainage concerns that we wanted to address within the area just to ensure that there's safety uh, because it is our assets and uh, I think we um, are trying to do our best to ensure that we're covered from liability standpoint uh, and you know I think that there is some movement there and we can have that discussion uh, if we can get into the details a bit at uh, maybe we can schedule a time to sit down and go over that. Okay, thank you, Director Cote. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything in the budget that we'll be talking about uh, community parks, uh, looking at places like Great Central Lake Boat Launch, which um, is more of a regional asset than a community asset. Um, so just wondering if there's any talk, anything in the budget this year to provision to start looking at that and um, the uh, trail at, at, uh, on the West Coast um, that is in my consideration, a regional asset rather than a, a area asset. Thanks. Dr. Cote, we'll have Terry get to you in a, in a moment. Do you mean the multi-use trail, the MUP pathway? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Terry, I see you're unmuted. Sure, if you don't mind, Michael, I'll jump in on this one. Um, so uh, we have regional parks governance kind of been sitting on the books for discussion, um, but have really been holding off until we find funding to construct the multi-use path because a lot of that um, discussion is gonna result because of that construction of that final piece. And I think um, we have had um, discussions at different points that talked about should that one less than one kilometer section of the multi-use path be the only section that lives in regional parks or are we wanting to bring in all the west coast sections and treat it as one path which would need to have a governance discussion um, including apportionments of cost so that is still kind of on the books but to be honest to date we're still just focusing on trying to find some grant funding to build that trail because until then nothing has really changed in regional parks as for bringing back new trails, I would say that I, I believe that the focus has been on existing infrastructure and um, we could get into that discussion, um, but it, it's not something that I have contemplated and put into the financial plan at this point. However, I don't know unless we are planning a major upgrade to it, um, which we're not planning on doing, I think till 2024 with community works funds. I think that we have some time to have those discussions. I think that's all for me. Okay, I have directors Bodner and then director Nab up next. Thank you to the chair, to Mike. I, I just wanna to clarify to follow up the, the telephone um, conversation that we had and I was thinking about it. From what I understand is that as far as Maplehurst Park is concerned, the only thing that's going to be done this year would be to put signage up on there saying do not park in people's driveways. However, you, uh, I, I wanted to ask again about the, um, the uh, road allowance. You said there's 120 meters or something at the end of, of um, Willow Road. You do not even if things go ahead that still isn't something that would be done, if that's done, it wouldn't be done this year. Is that correct? 
<clears throat> uh, yeah, I think the purpose of the park management plan would be to identify, you know, the best course of action from kind of a zoomed out uh, view. Uh, I think we can put uh, some effort into better communication with the local stakeholders and neighbors uh, to ensure that any immediate concerns are addressed, such as people blocking driveways um, and hopefully some signage and some enforcement in that way will address it. But I think, uh, you know, larger capital projects such as adding parking lots and infrastructure probably would wait until direction from the management plan once it's complete. Thank you. Please go ahead, Director McNabb. So I'm just gonna comment with regards to uh, the Great Center Lake uh, boat ramp. We did have $200,000 in the community works funding um, schedule uh, for, for that. I don't think that's moved anywhere, has it? That would be a Terry question, I think. No, it hasn't moved anywhere. I, I'm sorry, when I'm sharing my screen, I can't look up stuff at the same time. Um, okay. So I think that it is still in there, um, but when having that discussion, we didn't move it out of Sprout Lake Parks. So at this point, I'm running that money through Sprout Lake Park because that's where the boat launch currently resides in terms of legal ownership. If we want to designate that as a regional park and move it into the regional park function, then we need to have that discussion as a board and um, and, and do that. And that part has not been anticipated. Like to have that discussion this year was not something that I've added funding or anything to, but I also don't know what we would really need to add to facilitate that discussion in 2022. Second, second of that, yep. Dr. Jack. Okay. Uh, so this Maplehurst Park solution, um, uh, we really need to find a short-term solution as well as a long-term solution. Uh, you know, whether that means completely closing that park until we, till we uh, find a long-term solution or uh, because what the neighbors are putting up with, I mean, I'm getting phone calls uh, once or twice a week with regards to issues uh, that are happening. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just not fair to the neighborhood. Um, so I, I really would like uh, staff and management to kind of put their heads together to see if we, if we can come up with something that eases these folks' pain in a substantial way. And I'm not sure signage is going to do it because the kind of activity that's happening is the kind of activity that ignores signs. So uh, I, I just, we need to do something more effective than signs, I think. So I'll leave it at that for now, thanks. Thank you. I have Dr. Cote uh, and then Roberts up next. Please go, Director Cote. Thank you. Uh, so I was trying to look at uh, up the uh, strategic plan, which it's not at my fingertips, but I believe that uh, parks and um, moving on with this was was in our strategic plan as one of our desirable things to to be working on. So I'm just uh, I understand that um, it's looking at expanding on a service and changing the governance um, because I think there's only two or three. Um, identified areas that are in the parks, Mount Aerosmith being the beginning. Um, so I'm wondering if we shouldn't be looking at this um, in the 22 year and, and making sure there's something in the budget to accommodate. Um, we have studies on the shelf that haven't been um, utilized for many years now. Um, and I'd really like to get that going because I think it's important, uh, more important than ever. We could use things like um, the COVID um, grants, which we did use, but for on residential or uh, rural area uh, park, uh, I'd like to see it really happen. If there's any more uh, types of grants that we could use for regional park development um, because 
looking at Great Central Lake um, that was given to the regional district and the Spurt Lake Parks Commission didn't have an idea that this was under their um, governance and budget uh, until recently. Um, that as well as a couple of other parks that are out there. So I'd like to do some more work on community parks and regional parks. Thanks. Thank you. And just on that, and before we get to anybody else speaking, um, at the beginning of the process we've adopted here, Terry had spoken to having conversations where we don't have a parking lot, but we would ask certain uh, committees to tackle this issue. Um, I'm starting to think that because Director Cote is talking about kind of regional wide parks conversations that maybe this doesn't exist in any one committee and is referred to each of them or perhaps a committee the whole. Um, I suppose that's a question for not much later than soon, but um, I think that's something we should put our minds to. Um, with that, I cannot remember who we had next. I apologize. I think Director Roberts, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you uh, through the chair. I noticed that uh, in some of the budget highlights, uh, one of the things that we have from the capital reserve, or I should say um, uh, money is carried over and this was this was in the operating budget, there's $250,000 set aside for the construction of a parking lot for Meeklehurst Park. And in fact, there's an additional 61,000 uh, that was Parkland Reserve Fund uh, monies in lieu from developers that could be utilized for that service. So uh, I'm not sure uh, exactly the concern or the issue, is it just temporary signage that uh, that we're talking about or uh, this community works fund transfer of $250,000. I think that's a step in the right direction, is it not? Thank you. Uh, I, I'd just like to add that, you know, utilizing this process of creating the park management plan uh, to accurately reflect what we're hearing from stakeholders within the community, uh, before pursuing, you know, large infrastructure projects <clears throat> um, is kind of the park management plan uh, process that we've identified. So, you know, at the moment there's, you know, the issues identified that there's issues with Maplehurst Park um, and the access uh, and parking. And <clears throat> I think there's a couple potential solutions uh, that can be addressed at, in different locations, um, but you know, without properly engaging with the stakeholders, um, it's hard to to move forward with a, a project like that at this time. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, sounds like that bears mentioning and attention at some point in the future as well. Okay. Uh, are there any other comments or questions for Michael? I think, I think community parks and regional parks and trails is going to be something that we're going to be perhaps moving up in the agenda, so to speak, as a regional district. So uh, thank you for your work, Michael. I'm not certain if you have another slide or so, but please go ahead if you, if you do. Uh, yeah, this, uh, the Sprout Lake Marine Patrol is also my service. Um, <clears throat> so this service is, uh, we're continuing on uh, with what we've previously done in years past. Uh, we have a school outreach program focusing on boat safety. Uh, and then <clears throat> in the summer months, we're at the boat launch and on the water, uh, helping the public, um, you know, providing information about proper boat safety and <clears throat> uh, just public engagement uh, on those topics. Uh, I, should, I would like to note that the Transport Canada grant that we have uh, is in its final year. Uh, the goal is to apply for an extension and future funding for years forward. Um, but depending on how that application goes, uh, we may see some changes in uh, upcoming years. So. I, apropos of nothing, and hi, Mark. Um, I just want to say the emblem here is perhaps one of the best emblems I've ever seen made for the in the regional district area. So I, I know it doesn't matter that much, but it's um, it's really very striking. So whoever was involved in the creation of that, it's, it's great. Okay. 
I'll just give credit to our uh, summer students from last year. They were the ones that put together the emblem. So. Oh, that's that's great. Um, okay, are there any uh, closing comments or questions regarding the Sprout Lake Marine Patrol for uh, for Michael? Okay, seeing none, um, I think we're moving on. Oh, sorry, Penny, I have a please, question. please go. Please go uh, so uh, <clears throat> July to September, are they not doing the school programming starting in the end of May? Uh, yes, they'll, they'll be in the schools <clears throat> at the end of the year. Um, and they will potentially be spending some time at the boat launch, um, but it was just separated that way um, for the purposes of the slide here. So, so follow up, I, I'm assuming then that uh, with things opening up with COVID, um, we'll be able to have um, two of the Marine Patrol go out on the boat instead of all three or um, so that we can have um, people at the boat launch assisting and running the service the way it used to be run. That's what I'm wondering. Uh, so, so yes, last year we paid a consultant <clears throat> to provide some safe work procedures in relation to COVID protocols for this service. Um, uh, we'll re be revisiting those, uh, those procedures and, and, you know, adjusting the service as, as necessary here. Uh, and we did get the grant, right, for three years? Uh, well, this is the final year of that three-year grant. Uh, and it was extended a year because uh, it didn't run for the 2020 season, I believe. So. Okay. Okay, with that, I think that is it uh, for Michael. So thank you. And that brings us to the airport. Uh, welcome, Mark. Please take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you'll notice a theme with some of my photos coming up. Uh, we actually had winter this year at uh, both our airports. I'll give some highlights for uh, 2021. Uh, we had a challenging year 2021 just with, uh, with COVID. Um, a lot of our operations saw a decline in activity uh, for flight travel, both here and on the West Coast. Uh, the AVR Advisory Committee was able to uh, do a strategic plan through uh, COVID. Uh, that brought in a bunch of components um, working with the advisory committee, uh, internet signage and a celebration around the airport grand opening uh, for hopefully later on this summer. We've also come into uh, an issue uh, with uh, lease slots. Uh, we're getting tight on lease slots. We've come up with an, a conceptual plan uh, for expansion of lease slots at the airport. This would uh, include moving from uh, the airport current airside lease lot format and going across the road. So it's the south side of airport road. And it's in conception at the moment. Uh, and we're, we're, we're gonna be putting together a business case basically to support that. Uh, we've also got some issues with uh, FINRO and actually what we are allowed to do at the airport uh, with our Crown Grant. Uh, we've done some synergies with the two airports. Uh, one of these is an airport improvement fee uh, basically, it's a structure that Transport Canada used to have at their airports where it's basically an airport improvement fee tagged onto your lease payments. Uh, so that was instituted at uh, both sites this year, and that's helped in some of our cost recovery on the sites. Uh, as I mentioned before, our airport airside lease lots are at a premium right now at Avra. We have approximately one left, depending on how my... Um, development for the maintenance building uh, develops basically, uh, but we're basically at full capacity, which is a great thing. Um, we've had a really uh, large run on the lots over the last couple of years. I think a lot of people are seeing the potential on the site and uh, migrating their business plans to the Valley, which is a great thing to see. So we should see possibly two to three hangers besides the Bolson group uh, appearing on that site in 2022-2023. So that's that's great news. Uh, the other thing I highlight for 2021, we're looking at basically our COVID grant funding. Uh, we were successful in obtaining that uh, for airport operations, uh, offsetting some of our operational costs, both here and on the West Coast. So for 2022, moving forward, uh, we're looking at doing an equipment shelter 
the uh, we're doing some synergies with the West Coast as well on this, and I'll, I'll touch base on that a little later. But that's to be a, a piece of infrastructure that'll support some of our winter maintenance equipment that we have on the field. Uh, and as I mentioned with my slide, uh, we have done quite a lot of winter maintenance uh, this last, well, this winter period, more than usual. Uh, that's also in uh, to assist with BC Ambulance. The, as you're probably aware, the air ops uh, are no longer operating out of the hospital due to construction. So all of that operation comes into the AV Valley and we're trying to maintain that uh, surface clear for them for ambulance operations for medevacs over the valley. Uh, instrument approach procedures and OLS clearing. Uh, we currently have some trees left on the east side of the airport. Uh, we're still waiting for cut permits uh, with Flinrow um, that has been an ongoing uh, battle uh, through COVID. Uh, we're basically on year two for request on that. And uh, I've been working with Michael and uh, Flinro on this. Uh, hopefully we will see some light at the end of the tunnel later uh, this fall. We can get those completed. Mark, just to uh, interrupt you there. Um, yes. I'm not certain if you had defined it, but if you could define OLS just for oh, anybody who for, may be watching this. Yeah, I, 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 I get stuck in acronyms sometimes, sort of that. Obstacle limitation surface, so OLS. So an obstacle limitation surface is basically a clear path uh, through a airspace to the threshold of a runway. And that's required when we have an instrument approach procedure uh, that we want to maintain or have certified to a lower level. So right now we have an OLS that's cleared. That's why the Northwest Industrial Road was uh, constructed to the west, northwest of the airfield. And uh, we've basically dealt with most of the trees, probably 95% of the trees at that end. And on the east side, we still have some vegetation, which are a tree is an obstruction of that OLS that we have to remove. And that's what we're working toward with uh, cut permits with the province. And the capacity for enabling instrument approach procedures and instrument approach landings uh, vastly increases the potential of the, of the aerodrome, correct? Uh, that is correct. So we already have an instrument approach system on the field right now, but the breakout minimums are higher because we have these protrusions in the way. So the more protrusions we can remove or, or we can meet a standard, uh, the lower our instrument approach will come down. And the same with the AWOS, which is an automatic weather observing system. Uh, once we have that certified through Transport Canada, uh, we'll be able to even lower our limits further which will make it uh, a more useful uh, system for departures and arrivals under the airfield. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Nope, no problem. Uh, that's my fault. Uh, crack ceiling, an another issue, uh, even though we have a fairly new surface, uh, Port Alberni is subject to temperature extremes, both cold and hot. So uh, our asphalt doesn't expand uh, when we have such a big mat. Uh, as you would a uh, regular highway. So we have some cracking that uh, will need to be uh, filled. We tried to get this done in 2021, but right after Labor Day weekend, it just turned wet and we didn't have the opportunity to uh, complete that part of the project. We've also got fencing and access improvements uh, set up for this year. And we're also in the process right now of developing a business case uh, so we can actually come up with uh, costing and uh, basically viability of those expanded lots on the east, sorry, south side of Airport Road as part of our proposed airport expansion. And if there's any questions on Port Alberni, I can go on to the next slide then. Please, thank you. Okay, another winter theme, look at that. Uh, okay, uh, at basically Long Beach Airport, 2021, uh, we had a large reduction in passenger movements. Uh, we were basically down 85% over our regular movements um, and revenues accordingly. And of course, we had extra costs with uh, COVID planes and things like that. Uh, we were given a, or we were successful in a BCAP, British Columbia Air Access Program grant uh, for a water system upgrade. It's a fire flow upgrade for uh, the site. Uh, due to COVID and numerous uh, reasons, we actually didn't get that started till late December, early January. Um, but that is in full process. We have pipe going in the ground right now. Uh, we've had a large increase in uh, interest in long-term and short-term leases on the airfield 
2021, and that is also rolling into 2020-22. Um, I think that is in conjunction with the higher land values in the associated communities to be more equal in Area C. So we're getting a lot of businesses coming to us uh, asking for um, lease availability. And right now we're basically still working on that three, three year term lease, which is not uh, sufficient if uh, a company wants to put in significant capital into the site. Uh, once again, airport uh, COVID funding, uh, we were successful in obtaining that uh, through the province uh, and that was greatly appreciated. Uh, the final component for 2021, uh, not such a highlight, I guess, but uh, we had developed a large part of land uh, it's called Camp 4. It's an old military camp installation. It had road networks and everything in it. But when we actually uh, stumped that and cleared it off, we found a substantial amount of asbestos left behind by the military. So uh, even though we had uh, people lined up to lease portions of that, we had to cancel those leases. And we are still in the process of dealing with the federal government, uh, trying to take or make them take responsibility for the asbestos contained on that site. Uh, 2022, um, we have OLS clearing and basically vegetation management uh, planned on the airport. Once again, uh, through COVID, uh, we have had cut permits uh, requests in with Parks Canada over the last two years, which have basically not been dealt with uh, for various reasons, uh, most likely staffing on the Parks Canada side of the house. But uh, those are moving forward. Uh, rapidly now, and we're trying to get even some uh, cut permits from two years ago uh, completed before the bird nesting window, which is basically March 15th. So we're actively working on that file as we speak. The fire suppression upgrade through BCAP is continuing. Uh, the pipe should be in the ground basically by the end of uh, March 31st, where we will be going for a uh, variance on that program to also install the fire pump system at the reservoir. We're planning a new winter maintenance equipment building uh, with ACAP funding at uh, this site. And we're planning on actually bidding or basically putting both of those structures out, both uh, Port Alberni and the West Coast LBA at the same time. There could be some synergies that we could uh, see with the uh, larger value and a single contractor installing both those structures on both sites. Uh, we basically also were successful in an ACAP grant uh, for a wildlife control fence. Uh, right now, the airport is contained by about 30% uh, 30 contained. And uh, this grant opportunity would allow us to actually encircle the whole airport. We have had a large increase in deer activity over the last uh, two to three years. And uh, it's beyond, almost beyond the manageable component. Um, there is a cull as an option within the uh, national park. But basically on the West Coast, we are the donut hole in the national park. So uh, we wanna work with our neighbors and come up with uh, solutions that'll work for both parties. And I thought I saw a question. Nope, okay, keep going. Uh, we've also come up with uh, a plan for development of the airport terminal building, a uh, long-term capacity master plan. We've got uh, grant funding for this project as well. Issues we've come up with that were originated back in 2018, our current structure is designed for uh, small uh, commercial aircraft, you know, seven people in, seven people out, you know, 10 people in, 10 people out. Uh, 2018 saw the uh, introduction of Pacific Coastal Airlines into our site. And uh, suddenly you were getting hit with uh, 19 people in, 19 people out and doubled up even with SAVs at 34 to almost with double aircraft at one time, up to 40 people in and out. Uh, the current structure uh, is not handling those loads well. Uh, and I, I, it's a godsend in the fact that we had, we had COVID in the fact we didn't have to deal with those higher loads, but I see as things sort of return to a new normal, um, we're already, already noticing a larger passenger flows uh, basically in early February. So this plan will help us develop uh, future growth at the airport terminal, which is basically our transportation hub at this site. In conjunction with that, we're also talking about uh, land development, engagement and planning processes that we'll also use uh, some of this grant funding to uh, develop those programs at this site and try and streamline some of our uh, leasing issues on site. 
And of course, we have continued discussions with Colloquial First Nation on airport lands. And that's all I have. Are there any questions for Long Beach? Okay. Oh, please go ahead, Director Roberts. Yes, thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, much appreciated all the work you've been doing out there uh, as far as VCAP and ACAP uh, funding is excellent. The installation of the new wildlife control perimeter fencing is uh, something, I don't know if it's, is it available or needed for the Alberni Valley Airport? Uh, the Alberni Valley Airport already has perimeter fencing. The only uh, component that we are lacking at the moment is a small portion by the Colson's uh, construction or new maintenance building and the Dolan's um, basically way scale. Uh, and once we have those two land use issues uh, completed, uh, we will be able to uh, totally fence off the Port Alberni Airport. Thank you for that. And again, thanks uh, to yourself and staff for reaching out and, and acquiring all these grants. It's, it's phenomenal. A big money saver for uh, for 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 employees, or I should say, for um, residents of the communities on the west coast. Thank you. Yeah. Well, just one last comment through the chair. I'd just like to um, everybody I work with is excellent, and it's a great team. That's all I have. Thanks, Mark. It's um, it's been noted the the improvements and the work that's been going on in both of the airport facilities. So the hard work has been noticed and I think we'll start to really reap the rewards once the COVID restrictions start being lifted and you see more activity going on. Okay, I think that brings us now to, looks like waste management or solid waste management. I assume that Jenny will be the one to speak to this. Uh, we'll just let them get their video going and while Jenny is presenting, I just want folks to know that I'm going to have to hop off at 3.30 for an urgent phone call, but Director McNabb as vice chair will be taking over. It's likely that I'll come back. I just, I've gotten enough text messages that I, I think I do need to take this call. Um, that being said, uh, Jenny, please take it away. Um, I can actually, um, I believe Paulo, uh, our new solid waste manager was going to, oh, he's having technical difficulties. Um, I'm happy to speak to yeah. these slides. So, um, so uh, with the Regional Organics Project, um, we received, as the board knows, we received $6 million in strategic priorities uh, funding in 2020. Uh, phase one, which we implemented in 2021 in September, was very successful. That was for the city of Port Alberni. Um, it included upgrades at the Alberni Valley Landfill, as well as the rollout of the three stream uh, system for the city residents. So we did some audits and an education campaign, created an ACRD sort and go app, um, as well as an engagement platform. A lot of work went into this. Um, the rollout happened in September and we saw over 667 tons of organics diverted to um, the processing facility in the Alberni Valley. And when we looked just at the curbside collection for residents, uh, diversion was about 20%. That was just the recycling that we were collecting. And with the three stream program, that's jumped up to 60%. So we're very um, happy to see the success of that program. Next slide. Um, upcoming for 2022 is the second phase. So that is for the West Coast. This is gonna include the tender and construction of an organics facility at the landfill. We're also doing upgrades at the tipping area at the landfill. It's gonna look quite different when things are done. Um, and then again, we're implementing three stream collection at the curb with the standard cart. So similar to what happened in the city of Port Alberni, we're gonna be doing for Tofino, Euclid, and the electoral area Long Beach, as well as working with some of the First Nations who um, are looking at joining the service as well. Phase three is scheduled for 2023, but um, as most of you are aware, we started to do engagement for that earlier uh, this past month, just to see what is phase three going to look like. So we have a detailed report that'll be going to the ABB committee. So I'm gonna hold off talking too much about that and what that looks like, um, because really that committee needs to receive that information and then make a decision on moving forward. Um, 
and <laughs> we'll be continuing, sorry, Terry, <laughs> we'll be continuing uh, with promoting the uh, app. And this is just a shameless plug. If you haven't downloaded the app, please do. And please encourage everyone to download the app. It's very useful. Um, and we'll continue to use the uh, website as well as uh, developing the education plan. Okay, next slide. Um, for the Waste Management Center for Alberni Valley um, in 2021, as I mentioned, we had a lot of success with the organics diversion. There was also the installation of the meteorological station. Um, we upgraded the leachate wells, the backup wells, as well as the control system, and worked on the update for the uh, design operation and uh, closure plan for the landfill. And that's a requirement to update every five years. Upcoming in 2022, we have some upgrades for the Banfield Transfer Station. That will be some power and infrastructure improvements. We have an actual gas flare that will be installed um, to burn off. There's just one point where we do have a concentration of landfill gas. Generally speaking, we don't see a lot of it, but we have one point where it's concentrating in the existing network. And so we're installing a flare. Um, we also are going to be hoping to move forward with the Vancouver Island University Landfill Gas Monitoring Partnership, which has provided a lot of that detailed information. And then we're looking at upgrading the uh, McCoy pump station, which just provides water for fire protection, um, but the pump station needs to be upgraded. For the West Coast Landfill or West Coast Waste Management, um, some of the highlights from 2021 are that we completed the conceptual design for the leachate system. Um, we had a lot of uh, increased diversion, so we've continued with a mattress diversion program. We've really increased that, rope and netting, as well as the composting pilot, which will transition to the composting facility once that's in place later this year. The education program that's run through Surfrider continues to see a lot of success, especially in the commercial and tourism sector, and we're going to be relying on uh, them. They're a really big partner as we move forward with the uh, organics diversion. Upcoming in 2022, we have the detailed design for the leachate upgrades, and we're looking to construct that project in 2023. We are scheduling is sort of so that we're not building everything at the landfill at once. We're gonna do the organics facility and the tipping um, wall upgrades this summer. Next summer, the leachate uh, system will be upgraded. And uh, then we will, we're hoping on uh, three stream curbside collection will be the fall. We're looking at November right now at this point, and we have regular monthly meetings with our um, contractor, as well as we have a working group that is basically working together to come up with a detailed plan, similar to what we did for the uh, city program. So we've got a lot of exciting stuff on the books coming up in solid waste. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. There we go. Please go ahead, Director Roberts, and then Director Beckett. And we see you there, Paulo. Thank you for moving. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I uh, appreciate the work that's going on out there. Can you detail the areas where curbside collection is going to be occurring uh, on the uh, on the west coast? I know that the, the residents of Salmon Beach would really like to see that happen out there, tongue in tongue in cheek sort of thing. Right? I know it'll be. Uh, It'll be well covered for uh, Millstream and uh, other areas out there. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, the West Coast Phase Two includes Tofino Euclid, Millstream, um, and we're looking at potentially um, Hitatsu as well as Eswista and Tayasanis. Salmon Beach falls outside of that area as well as Makoa. Um, we are looking at Salmon Beach under actually Salmon Beach Services and looking at what is going to be the system for Salmon Beach that will work. But essentially, that is actually part of uh, phase three. So it won't be dealt with in 2022, but it will be dealt with in 2023. So we don't have a detailed plan. We're still working on that. Thank you for that. Okay, next up, I believe, is Dr. Bodner. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just um, I'm, I'm curious because of the reaction you've had from some of the electoral area districts regarding um, the um, uh, certain assortment of organics and whatnot. Um, it's 
it, do you have a plan B if it if it turns out that this the electoral areas do really don't want it? Thank you. Yes, through the chair. Um, absolutely, we are focused on waste diversion. That is the fundamental goal for this program, right? To achieve our diversion targets, reduce waste generation. There's many ways that we can achieve that. Um, with the engagement that we were doing, we were just looking to see if curbside was a good fit in order to move forward with that. Um, there is a myriad of uh, options and we do detail that out in the report, which will be on an agenda going out uh, this Friday. You should receive that. Thank you. Okay, are there any other comments or questions? Okay, is that it, Jenny? Yeah, all right, well, Paulo, since you're here, did you have anything you wanted to add? If not, it's okay. Uh, no, just briefly, just a shout out again to the, uh, the team uh, putting everything together, especially for the organics program. It kicked off very, very well, and we're looking forward to developing it further this year. Thank you for that. All right, next up we have a discussion of the Beaver Creek water system. Welcome, Eddie. And I'm going to pass off the chair to Director McNabb as I think I have to get ready for that phone call. So thank you, everyone. I, it's very likely I'll come back, but thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so it's good to be here, just starting with the Beaver Creek water system and some of the 2021 highlights. As you know, of course, we purchased a new vehicle late in the year, so we're awaiting delivery on that. Um, there were an increased number of leaks within the system last year, which allowed for more or for less improvement projects, sorry. And I don't think they directly related to my starting. It was my first week, and I believe we had three leaks back to back to back. So a bit of a curse, I think. And then we also completed in 2021 the unidirectional flushing program design. So... Uh, we have the design, worked with CORE's engineering on that, and in 2022, that's actually one of our items is the completion of the actual flushing program. So that will commence in the next couple of months. Also in 2022, uh, we have the Georgia Road Water Main Transfer Project. So we are transferring this over to the city of Port Alberni. There's 14 properties that are transferring over to a parallel water main. And then as we move forward with our water main replacement project, uh, Karen Place is next. So we have a 650 meter section of Karen Place that will is due for replacement this year. And then continuing with our, our team's um, strategy of always having a project shovel ready, we have the Smith Road water main design project replacement. So we have Cores Engineering kind of putting together the design for that project as well. And then the team will be working with White Pacific to, to look at our, our SCADA system within the Beaver Creek water system and do an assessment of that. And then I already did speak to the unidirectional flushing program. So if I guess I can take questions on this now. So one of the things that uh, I noticed in our budget is that we, we had the pricing for the new vehicle, but we didn't have any uh, estimation of the recovery cost on the one it was replacing. So that was something I talked to Jenny about, uh, needs to be modified. And uh, so hopefully that's gonna show up somewhere in the future. Yes, uh, thank you, Director McNabb. In, in talking with Terry about this one, we were going to kind of allocate that pricing and, and look at that once the vehicle was a little bit closer to being delivered. Um, unfortunately, given the, the current market right now, we had a three to six or more month uh, delivery timeline given to us. So we do have time for that. Well, the problem is the budget's an annual budget. And, you know, we could put an estimated price in there and just reduce the capital transfer. Uh, I mean, you're always going to have surplus and unexpected costs, but uh, we can estimate that it's going to be some price and go from there. Um, and the other, the other part of it was with, re with regards to our uh, uh, development cost charge uh, balance and uh, the implementation of uh, using development cost charge on uh, 
uh, projects that were uh, uh, that suitable and uh, reduce the uh, the outflow of the uh, uh, the reserve fund. Uh, so just paperwork. Other than that, I got nothing. Okay, so on to the Banfield water system. 2021 saw the some replacements of the submarine, West Banfield submarine line. So we had some aging infrastructure there and some uh, renewal and protect, protection, protective measures were completed. We also had the completion of the asset management plan and a long range infrastructure renewal and replacement report. So 2022, we'll see us uh, proceeding with the development cost charge bylaw update. Um, our development, we, we do see a rising amount of development in the area, so we're gonna update that. Um, we're also gonna be continued work to bridge the gap between our current funding levels in the Banfield water system and those identified in the asset management plan. And then, you know, as always, and with our new grant coordinator, we'll be working closely to uh, look and apply for grant opportunities for continued infrastructure renewal. Any questions? No, I think Cal's, or uh, Bob's clapping in the background. I hear something. Okay, moving forward to the mill stream. So 2021 saw us utilize community works funding for the addition of ultraviolet disinfection at our pump house. Uh, we also had a, an upgrade to variable speed pumps and improved control and communications on our system there. And then staff undertook a system audit to ensure that there were fair and equitable rates collected within the system, really identifying um, those connections that had more than one connection. So we did identify seven additional properties there. And then as we look ahead towards 2022, we will be utilizing community works funding for the replacement of the pump house building. And then, you know, as mentioned in Boundfield, it's that continued work to, to bridge the funding gap between our current levels and then the requirements as outlined within the asset management plan there. And then we'll be working with our water team with the, to, to create an in-depth preventative maintenance plan for Millstream. So we'll be developing that early in 2022 and then implementing it uh, halfway through. If there are any questions on Millstream water system, I can take those before proceeding. Okay, on to Salmon Beach. So as Jenny mentioned, um, the options for recycling and organics diversion will be studied uh, within the community, community and then presented. That's a, a part of that stage three. Um, in regards to Salmon Beach security, we will be working for the replacement of the gate arms. We have secured some quotes, so that is in the budget. Uh, Salmon Beach sewage system, we upgraded to a level three sewage system last year. So this increased uh, the capacity of the system. So with that and with some of the other items within the system, we are going to look at the current pump and haul rates to see if uh, they require an update. Salmon Beach Transportation, we're going to continue to work to move forward with the implementation of the five-year road improvement plan. And then along with that is establishing a, a culvert installation program. Working with the Salmon Beach Committee on the recreation side of things, we've identified um, some improvements for the boat launch area. One of those is the installation of, of Moby mats to increase the accessibility of the beach area. And then a kayak launcher to ensure that boaters and kayaks uh, both have space on the launching pad. Um, and then we'll be looking towards the picnic and gazebo areas and what upgrades are necessary there. Any questions on Salmon Beach? Well, just let everybody you know I, I've only got six squares on my uh, my uh, visuals here. So if you need to input, input uh, yell. Thanks. So you got anything on that, Cal? You got it. Okay, you're I good. I could uh, just make a comment, uh, Chair McNabb, along those lines. If we use the raise hand function, it should bump to the top of your screen so people 
feel that they're not being heard, they can always use that and you'll see them on your screen. That'll be handy. Onward and upward. Okay, moving forward with Alberni Valley Custom Transit. So 2021 saw a continued uh, reduction in the hours of operation due to COVID. Um, so there was a continued loss of pas passenger revenues, uh, but there was also a reduction in operating costs. We did continue to utilize the Safe Restart grant funding and that will be utilized until uh, the end of March of 2022. Um, kind of one other item is BC Transit moved uh, from billing in budgeted amounts to actual amounts, which did create lower operating costs in 2021. As we look towards 2022, um, we are expecting a, that continued reduction in hours, uh, at least through the first part of the year. Um, the good news is, though, as far as ridership recovery is, when we look at the July, December period of 2021, as compared to the same period in 2020, ridership was up by 56%. So we can see that that recovery and, and regaining that ridership trajectory is going upwards. So there's some good news there. And then another piece uh, as we look forward is, is the, uh, the commencement of that regional transit study which will be starting in spring of 2022 and likely being completed by the end of 2022. Any questions on custom transit? Okay, so West Coast Transit. Uh, again, we're looking towards 2022. So we're gonna continue with that planning towards service implementation. So this includes the determination and working with BC Transit and our partners on locations of an operations and maintenance facility. We're looking at the bus stop design and infrastructure development. So including everything as far as construction for the bus stops, bus shelters, et cetera. And then the completion of all partner agreements. Uh, at some point in mid to end of 2022, the service provider will be selected through BC Transit led RFP process. And then as far as service commencement, it was pushed to 2023, uh, as mentioned, due to a delay in the delivery of buses. So we are looking at some point in 2023. And I believe that is all, if we have any questions. Anybody out there? Nope, we're good to go. Okay, and the last service is mine, and it's not actually a regional district service, but because it has the same taxpayers, we do talk about it um, today as well. So this is the Alberni Clayquart Regional Hospital District. Um, we'll be talking about that budget on March 9th at the budget or at the regional hospital district meeting, but it includes the West Coast General Hospital room renovations, which continue into 2022. I think they're hoping to be done either late this year or early 2023. And then just a reminder that the West Coast General Hospital District debt is um, retiring. There's very little debt remaining. And we have started to build a reserve fund um, to offset the future debt for the construction of a new um, Tofino General Hospital facility. So um, the budget at this point has been drafted with a 2% increase over last year. Um, and we will discuss that at the March 9th um, meeting in more detail. Um, and Happy to answer any questions on the hospital district. And so I have a question with regards to the funding for the emergency room. Uh, so has that been actually handed over or do we have it that they, they'll ask for it? Is that what happens? Yeah, they actually um, request it every month. So we have requisitioned all the funds. I have the funds sitting here, but we don't hand it over to um, Island Health until they expend it. So every month they provide me um, support documentation of what they've done to date and we um, write them a check for that portion, so. Okay, great. Anybody else? I have a question, Penny. Yep, go ahead. Uh, so uh, will we be able to get a uh, uh, copy of all of your slides here because there's a lot of information that's in there that I don't have in the agenda? Definitely. We're going to um, load these um, after this meeting onto the website. It's too large to email, but we will load it onto the website and then we can send the directors a link to um, where we've loaded it. 
And for those of you that are having community presentations, it'll be a modified version of this, a shortened modified version um, um, to your area. Yeah, we're happy to answer um, any questions for any of the topics. Otherwise, I think that um, that pretty much summarizes the 2022 to 2026 financial plan. And we look forward to discussing it further with you as we go along. I have another question. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was, uh, because there wasn't enough information, I guess, uh, regarding um, the regional district services um, and that $50,000 from each of the electoral areas for um, fire service. Um, I'm just wondering where that's in. Is it in my fire department budget or is it in emergency planning or? It's yes, no, it's, it's in your fire department budget. It's a line, just a sec, let me just get there. It's right at the bottom of the spreadsheet. So it's the, yeah, the very last line says fire services plan implementation of $50,000. That's where it, it, it has been included. Okay. Looking at a different page, so. Uh, page 176. 176, okay. Different. Sorry. We're there right now. Okay, okay. That, is that a hand up, Tanner? No, that's my, that's my button. With... <laughs> okay. All right, anybody else? Yeah, all of that information, we gotta have like a ton of questions coming back really tough ones to stump everybody. No, no I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm okay with this. <laughs> no, but please ask, because the earlier we get them out on the table and know what you guys want to bring no, forward. Oh, there's the Cal. He's got his hand up, waving it like crazy. Go ahead. No, I'm just waving to say hi. No. No. Oh. <laughs> Actually, I just wanted to confirm, we were originally scheduled uh, a board and budget and hospital meeting on the 16th of March, and I take it that's been change to the ninth now is that correct do you have a confirmation there? um it's the ninth so our board meeting is on the ninth and the 23rd of march did we have the wrong date on there no that's fine i i uh sort of had it scrubbed out but i've got a potential other meeting on the 16th or 16th or the 17th so that's great thanks okay anybody else before we disappear into the land of Oz or wherever we go. No. Nope. So, uh, what do we do about the people participating on Zoom? Is there emails out there somewhere? Oh, Wendy, is there anyone from Responses? Hi, um, Mr. Chair. We don't have any attendees today, and there's no questions um, from the public, public respecting the agenda today. Okay, anybody else from on the board? You're all clear? Man, you guys, the staff has done a wonderful job to get this far and have no questions. <laughs> all righty, so a motion to adjourn, I guess, is in hand. Director Shannon, Director Bodner, everybody else, all in favor? Mm -hmm. Carried, we're out of here. Thanks very much for your participation.